Jag har ska nu. Jag gissar en justa. This story, this history, it's not really a story, it's a history that's not been told. This country and its people have been denied the true history of this so-called discovery of America. And it was, um, it was a mistake right from the beginning. Christopher Columbus thought he landed in India because he had no idea there was a, a whole hemisphere that they didn't know about here. And this hemisphere that was here had civilizations and millions and millions of people. And some of those Inca civilizations in South America, what's now called South America, they were doing brain operations. And then what do you call now North America? Democracy was rampant. It was everywhere. So the values, the values that were here, secured from any interruption from Europe, developed here, were fundamental values of working together and the common good. If there were and I would say two laws, two laws that prevail and prevailed anywhere you were in North America, foundational principles. The first one was to share. You shared everything. Hunters, hunters who were in the woods and they were fortunate enough to to make a, a kill, they left meat hanging for someone else to share. Or if there was an animal hanging there waiting for someone to come and pick it up, anybody passing through could help themselves. This whole idea of sharing was the idea of community. The community was really foundational to almost every, as far as I know, every indigenous nation in North, Central, and South America. Strong, strong issues of community, living together and sharing. And the principle was always number one principle was for the good of everybody. At times that was, that was really drawn into, called into action, called into life and death, basically. But it was always kept. And there were many, many millions of people in the Western Hemisphere. When we went to speak at the United Nations in 1977, we had a long discussion in an island off of uh, British Columbia, 1975. And the discussion was well, now, for the first time, we're going to have a delegation uh, to address the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, foundational question is how will we identify ourselves? It was a long discussion because we had delegates from Chile and, and from uh, the Amazon 
from North America and South America, Central America, a lot of people there. And we went through, you know, the usual list of native people, so we call ourselves indigenous people, um, the garment. And we decided on indigenous because the native people of this Western Hemisphere are not all Indians, or what you call Indians. And, uh, and so we decided that indigenous was a broad covering, it covered everybody, it covered the native people in the islands, it covered the native people in the near the North Pole, it covered Native people everywhere, indigenous, because that's what we were. We were the original people, and that's how we announced ourselves when we went to Geneva. We are the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. And today you will, si you will see that the word indigenous is common usage now, but that was our declaration. And we're the ones that started that. Prior to that, we were called everything, I guess you might say. But anyway, so when we went to Geneva in 1977, we said the number one issue that we were bringing to terms was, was the treaties. That was going to be the number one underlying issue of all the people there, the treaties that were made and the bargains that were made with the different colonies, with the different, with the different nations from Europe, with the new United States, treaty after treaty. Those were agreements, international standard. And that's what we said in Geneva, these are international standards. These are not as... Uh, the United States often said local or domestic. They use the word domestic. The Haudenosaunee, the Six Nation, has never been domesticated. We're not domestic now. We know we're never domestic. We are indigenous, a free, free nation, a free people. And so those were some of the challenges that were just fundamental to our arrival. And uh, we had no idea how we were going to be, how we were going to be accepted. But we had a very brave group. And prior to that, in the preparatory meetings that we had across um, the United States, um, they, they said, they being the rest of the indigenous peoples, they said, you know, uh, you, you Iroquois, you, uh, you, you're, you're used to these people, you know these people, you met them long ago, you have a lot of uh, experience with them. And they said, for some of us, we just, we met them much later. And we didn't have that dialogue that you had, so... Um, at a meeting that we held in New York City in 1971, 1971 in a park not far from the United Nations. We sat there and they asked us if we would take the lead. Would you be, would you be leaders? And uh, there were some young chiefs at that time, myself included, and they asked if two young Onondaga leaders, myself and Irving Paulus Jr., his, his dad was also a chief, Irving Paulus Sr. And my dad was a faith keeper, so yeah, I am. Um, they asked if we would take the lead, if we would be, and uh, because we were 
the more educated when I had at that time had a, a a degree, a university degree. And they said, well, you handle a lot of language a lot better than we do. Would you, would you guys be, take that? So we agreed. And we were never relieved from that duty. So I'm still operating under that agreement and it's all voluntary. And of course, there's no remuneration there. We don't get paid for it. But it's just responsibility. And the issue, of course, is security of our nations, our people, and our lands. It's a long history. And uh, the history of our people, the Haudenosaunee, started long before the landfall of Columbus. And a peacemaker just gave us probably the greatest gift and of governance based on three principles, based on the first principle of, of the Haudenosaunee is peace, peace. The second principle is the equity. And the third principle is the union the United Nations, probably the first one. It's hard to say exactly when our union was formed, and um, guesses go all the way back to 2,000 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, but they're zeroing in now on 900 AD. And it may be, but certainly we were, our union was old, old and venerated long before Columbus landed on our shores and a, a new style of life immediately began there. So the first thing that Columbus brought was pandemic. He brought a boatload of disease that we never had here. At best, the common cold. But the diseases that he brought on that ship spread across our lands like wildfire. And we had a pandemic and it wiped out untold thousands, hundreds of thousands of people swept through. We had no defense. We had no defense against measles, much less syphilis. Nothing. So we died. Great numbers. And he didn't have to come through the land. Because once a pandemic starts, as you can see very clearly today, it travels and it travels fast. So that was the first pandemic, a huge one. We survived that. Much diminished our numbers. Nevertheless, our systems and our governance was not. We maintained that integrity. And the next thing that came a year after Columbus landed and returned back to Spain, uh, Christopher Columbus, as it turns out, you know, was, was a mercenary. He was Italian working for Spanish government, being paid by Queen Isabella. And he was also a zealot. He was a Christian zealot. And he was also a carrier of disease. He was also a murderer. Slaughtered many of our people. And the Spanish, you have to 
put yourself in that time and what was what was going on in Europe in 1493 and 1492 and 1490 and 1450 it was the Inquisition there was the Inquisition of the Roman Catholic Church, and they were killing their own people. They were putting people on crosses. They were cleansing, they said. This was their idea, cleansing. They were vicious. And right in the middle of all of that, that's what came over on the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. That's what came across. It was not a gift, but it certainly was. I guess the it, it set it set a a process of relationship. Science at that time in the so-called Western world was very limited. And Europe had undergone plague after plague. And people had become immune to that. They had learned to, to deal with it, the immunity. They lived with animals in their house, the goats and the chickens were in the house. In North America, we didn't have those kinds of domestic animals. So we were living kind of a pure style of life. The waters of all those rivers here, the streams, the, the springs, the lakes, are pure. You could drink the water. You could drink the water anywhere. It was pure. If you can imagine. And when they talk about the life in Africa, of the Serengeti Plains, of all the animals, as far as you can see, it was here too. Buffaloes as far as you could see, antelopes, deer. When they first got here and they, they saw our relationship with the deer, they thought that we had domesticated the deer because we were working with them. And, and so the pandemics that they brought, that was the first pandemic. But there were more that came. And we suffered through all of that. And we managed to survive, but then probably the most, for us, the most terrible declaration that was made was made by Pope Alexander the Sixth. This was a year after the so-called discovery here. And I'm going to paraphrase what he said because it's all written down in Latin. We have the actual document, we have the translation. And what he said was basic if there are no Christian nations in these new lands that you have discovered, I declare those lands to be empty. Terra nullius. Further, he said, if there are people there and they are not Christians, they do not have a right of title to land. They have only the right of occupancy. That was one year after the so-called discovery. 
And with that statement, he regulated and relegated the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere to something less than human, something in between the animals and the civilized, so-called civilized world that they lived in. We were in, what I would say, no man's land. We didn't have a right to title of land. Now, this is a statement coming from, I think at the time, Spain and the Pope. I'm not sure whether the Pope was in Portugal there or, when, you know, because their headquarters changed. Italy, Portugal, Spain. But anyway, that was the statement, and we were up to 2005 relegated to something less than human. In 2005, when the United Nation of New York was making a land claim, and it got before the Supreme Court, Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg issued a statement saying that the number one position that they had was the doctrine of discovery. 2005. In other words, we were still something less than human, something less than, we were part of the flora and the fauna. Not that strong. Good company, mind you. Can't get any better than that. <laughs> but in the politics of the world, not so good. Not so good. There we were. And reiterated just 15 years ago. And the sad part of all of this is that the American public has been denied that knowledge, has been deliberately kept ignorant of everything, of the history, the real history of this, what we call Turtle Island. And that's, that's a crime. That's a crime in itself. It's a crime against your own people. They don't know better. They're ignorant. Just uh, probably two months ago, I, I got a, a letter of asking for support from uh, a young Six Nation woman who, uh, who was starting a rugby team. <laughs> had a boys and girls rugby team up in Six Nation, Ontario. She wanted some help. I said, sure, that's a good idea. And, uh, and she said, well, we have a problem. And one of the problems is that this rugby team in England, Exeter, the Exeter Chiefs, they called themselves, and there had a mascot, which was, of course, this idiot dressed up as a native person with a feather headdress and a tomahawk with some crazy antics out there. She said, we, we want them to drop that. So it brought things right up to present time. Indigenous people are mascots to no one. We're no one's mascot. But because our numbers are so diminished, we didn't have that fighting power that the black people had. The black people's numbers, 25, 30 million. That's, that's good fighting numbers. You gotta pay attention to that. Our people, 
less than a million and a half. And the big question, of course, is what happened to him? What happened to 16 million people in North America at the landfall of Columbus? Good question, never been talked about, but it's time to bring it forward because that is really genocide with a capital G, genocide. And until you deal with past histories and rectify that, you have no way forward. And if the American public had been kept ignorant of that very deliberately by the forces of government, then how can you advance? If you've been fed, I would say fed deliberately, this idea of exceptionalism, above and beyond everybody, just great people. And that's all you've been taught, or that's what you believe. In reality, all people are equal. In reality, there's no races. There's no black race, there's no yellow race, there's no red race or white race. There's human beings. Human beings, and the commonality between all of these colors that we have, because human beings come in all colors. We're just like dogs, you know, we're coming in all colors and all sizes, but we're still all people, just like they're still all dogs. And so we're a species. That's what we are, we're a species, we're the human species. And the commonality is that we can change blood with one another. I don't care what color you are. And if you're in that state of bare existence looking for support and a pint of blood coming from a black man into your so-called white body, it makes no difference whatsoever. It's the same. In America, they make a point of racism. I came here with that idea. It pervades everything they do, and it's still here. And it's surfacing now. And with that idea of racism, there's always right behind it fascism. Fascism has always been tickling around there, but now you see it. You see American white men wearing swastikas today. But that's been in the blood a long time. That's a long time. You have to get beyond that. If we're going to survive as a species, we have to work together. We have to have common cause. We have to be fair. We have to let the stragglers catch up to us. We can't walk that fast that you have people straggling and get lost. You got to stop. Let them catch up. Work together. So, this country has to first of all tell the true history of its origins. so that it can move forward. It's being tested now. And um, there's a resurgent now, suddenly. Suddenly people are asking questions. You know, and all of those people on the streets protesting, it's always been either black people or people of color or Never any white people. It's very interesting to me now when I see those people on the streets, there's white people out there, and sometimes more than any other. 
And so the issue there, of course, is uh, who has and who hasn't, haves and have-nots. And these people are beginning to understand that they have also been regulated to workers. I remember one conversation I had with this very hard-nosed farmer from Midwest, You Indians, he said, you Indians. When, for us, you wouldn't even be here. Oh, really? Well, what is it that saved us? He says, well, democracy. Oh, really? And what's that? He says, well, it's capitalism. Oh, I said, are you a capitalist? Yes, I am. I said, where's your capital? What's that? He says, you see, they don't understand. He didn't understand. He's not a capitalist. He's a worker. He's just like anybody else struggling. The capitalists, of course, if you will note, in this particular event we're having right now, have made a lot of money. They're, they're making money because they're capitalists and they have control. And so what I fear, in 1775, when we had a meeting with the Continental Congress of the United States at their request in Albany, New York, they called us. They were preparing for a battle. And they called us and said, we need to have a meeting with you, Six Nation. Yes, our leader said, that's indeed true. We certainly do, because it's bad things are happening. So the delegations went to German flats in the spring, led by the Oneida Nation, and they set up the protocols for the meeting that was going to take place later on that year. And when we arrived, there was a lot of protocol, and a lot of that protocol was Six Nation protocol. And they were abiding by that. We had instructed them in our style of governance. It was pretty much prevailing straight across everywhere. How to speak, when to speak, how to present, when to present. Time for reflection, time for discussion, all of that. The old protocol with us. They learned it and they used it. And the use of what they call wampum, what go at what we call wampum, belts. You didn't have a meeting if there wasn't some belts or some exchange there. That was our style. And so the English knew how to make the belts. They made them. The French did. They all did. Because that was the protocol. So what they said then They said, our father has mistreated us. And they went on in a long diatribe of how they were being mistreated by their father, who at that time was the king of England. And they said, it's come to the point where we are going to stand and fight. We're not going to accept this. And so our request is for you to join us in this battle, coming battle. And our leader said to them at that time, they said, well, we know your father. Just had discussion with him this spring. Oh, really? What did he say? And they said, what was in discussion, very similar to what you're saying. Big fight coming. And they said at that time, well, 
we see this event coming. It's going to be very destructive and disruptive to everybody, our people, your people, and it's going to take place across our land. But we see this as a conflict between father and son. And it's well known, not a good idea to step inside a family fight. They'll both turn on you. So we would uh, prefer to step aside. And they said, good, that was our second request. If you weren't going to fight with us, don't fight against us. And they said, well, that's, that's really what our intention would be. We see it's coming. We know it's coming. We've been with you every step of the way. You're rebels. You're rebelling. You're English. And so we struck a treaty of neutrality, 1775. And they were very pleased with that. And they said to us at that time, in this treaty of neutrality, when we win, when we win, they said, they were sure they're going to win. <laughs> when we win, you will never have to raise your arms in your own defense. We'll fight all of your fights for you because of what you're doing. And so it went. And we said at that time, well, this has been coming for a long time, and, and we have the same problem that you have. Our minds of some of our people are split. Some are going to be this way, some are going to be that way. But we're, we're united on one thought, that we will not fight as a confederacy, as a Haudenosaunee confederacy. We will not fight as a confederacy, nor will we fight as nations. But you will see our men in this coming fray, and they will be on both sides, because their minds are split too. And because we are free people, we can't tell our men not to go. That's their, up to them. They will be out there, but when you see them, understand they're there on their own. They're not representing the nation or the Confederacy. So, that was the discussion. And they said, well, they said in 1744, you advised us to make a, a union like yours at Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And the speaker representing the Continental Congress repeated the words of the Anadarka chief, Gunasatega, Word for word, what she said, 1740, 1744. You can make a union like yours. And he went on to say how they teach their children about the bundle of arrows, he said. Really? The bundle of arrows? And what was that? And that was the beginning of our confederacy. That was the peacemaker who took five arrows representing the five nations, and he tied them with the sinew of the deer very tightly. He took one arrow and he snapped it. He says, this is a nation, he snapped it. And he took the bundle of arrows and he said, this is your strength, union. Many, many hundreds of years ago. We teach our children about the bundle of arrows, they said. So obviously, they knew our history as well. And how, why wouldn't they, after three or four hundred years of discourse between us? Of course they would. And you really didn't have a meeting. In the East Coast, if delegates from the Haudenosaunee weren't there. That's what you don't know about your own history. You don't know four hundred years of intercourse you never told about where this whole idea of democracy came from. And it's about time you did. 
As I look about today, I see that the situation is very frail and this whole idea of democracy. If less than 1% of your population owns more than 60 to 70% of the wealth, that is not democracy. So you are now in a struggle and it's probably timely because at the same time that we're in this struggle between human values and humanity and so forth, we have an existential crisis called global warming. And we were told by hundreds and hundreds of scientists that you have a very limited time. In the year 2000, I addressed the United Nations at New York. And the message was, the ice is melting. That's 20 years ago. 20 years ago, in the General Assembly, I said, the ice is melting. It's melting in the north. The winds are coming. 20 years ago. So here we are today, squandered 20 years, and I don't see the leaders of the world meeting this issue. There's guns out there, military, gunships. No discussion about the future of the earth itself. You know, nature has no mercy. Nature only has law. And if you don't abide that law, you suffer the consequence. Simple. No habeas corpus, no way you can mediate, no lawyer to call, nobody to get in your defense. You are dealing with reality. And that reality is severe. And it's pretty absolute. And we have now challenged that. Almost 8 billion people in the world today, 7.7, .7, probably 7.8 by this time, billion people. When I was 20 years old, 1950, there was 2.5 billion people in the whole world. It tripled the population in one lifetime. There's a consequence to that. The water, the land, How are you going to survive? Where's the equity? If you had followed our advice in 1775 and there was equity for everybody, we may have a chance. But today, what you see is inequity, severe inequity. Nations of Africa struggling. Very, very wealthy people securing or a bundle of gold. So, Christopher Columbus, God, glory, gold, brought you to this position. God, glory, gold. And gold has prevailed. Greed. When the peacemaker talked to our people way, 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 way back, he said, there are two, there are two things that can destroy your nation, he said, within yourself. First one is greed, and the second one is jealousy. It can destroy your nation. We were told that way back. So what we see today then is greed prevail. And democracy well 
I'm going to end this little discourse now from taking time ranting and raving here. But democracy is still on the line. And I see people out there waking up right now, and I see them moving, and there's possibility, a real possibility that they may make these changes. They just got rid of uh, Washington Redskins. <laughs> it was, it was, look how long that took. But they did it. And they're on, the, they're on the streets now, and they're out there, and they're talking, and they're saying, there's got to be a better way, and there always was a better way. It just was subverted. It was just taken away. So now you have a chance. And I would say, we're in the 15th round of a heavyweight championship fight. This is the last round, and I would say, fight is even. We can win. I can win if you put your mind to it. We can prevail. We're not going to stop global warming. It's going to go. But we can work collectively for survival of a species so that your children know what the peacemaker told us. Make all your decisions on behalf of the seventh generation coming. Not for your nation. He says, not for you. Not for your family. Generations coming. Speak on their behalf you yourself will have peace. So that's not complicated, it's just very difficult because it's about values. And so a group that we got invited to, 1988, let's say uh, parliamentary a uh, group for human survival. Uh, we were invited to attend in London. And they liked what we added. We, we added to that conversation because there were very good people in that group for human survival. Very good people. And um, we added our voice. They liked our voice. And so meetings went on into Moscow. We met in Moscow. Then we met in um, Tokyo. And at the meeting in Tokyo, I asked uh, Akio Matsumura, who was the executive director of the Spiritual and Parliamentary Leaders for Human Survival, Akio, isn't it about time we have a have a statement here? It's about time we come to some kind of conclusion? We're talking. Good ideas, I think so. Let's put it out in front of over 250 delegates from around the world of very, very high quality people. We put the question out. Can we come to a conclusion? And they put their minds to it. And there was a conclusion. We have one. All right, very good. What is it? Four words. After all those meetings, four words. Value change for survival. If you don't change your values, you're not going to survive. There you have it. Now you go back to the gold. God, glory, and gold. Value change for survival. So, that's the issue. And then I'll give the last word, the last word to my, <laughs> what I, uh, my philosopher, my contemporary philosopher that I go to every now and then because he just seems to get things right here and there. 
And you know who that is? That's the catcher for the New York Yankees, Yogi Berra. He says things that are really sort of off the wall, but at the same time it has consequence to it. Good observer. No, his words were the one that I use today. It ain't over till it's over. And that's right where we're at. So I urge everybody to fight. Stand up and speak up and fight. For your children, for the future, for the earth. Stand. You're not going to get another chance. This is it. Last round. Fights even. Go get him. Donate. I'm done.